Good morning. Happy summer. Let us begin our worship service. It is uh, Communion Sunday. It is a wonderful Sunday. Whatever it is that is on your heart, let us center into Jesus. Will you please stand as you are able and let me invite our fabulous certified lay minister to come forward to lead us in our opening prayer. Good morning. It is so good to be with you here on this beautiful Sunday morning in worship. And welcome to all of you joining us online, wherever you might be. Would you join me in the spirit of prayer? Lord, just as you have welcomed us when we were strangers with no home, just as you have taken us in others said no, we ourselves seek to welcome those who have come to worship and praise your holy name. We welcome you this morning in this place to sit down and be present with us. Let us worship God. Amen. Love to those around me. 
It is the fourth Sunday in a sermon series that we have been focused on calling and discipleship. It is a good uh, summer, June, July is a good time to be thinking about our calling, the calling of God into the scriptures and what it means for our life. Pastor Frank and I have preached on the call of individuals and how we're tagged to call to, and called to go out into the world and transform the world through God's love. Today we finish up this series on calling and discipleship as we think about welcoming, welcoming. We have a brief scripture to engage us today uh, at the close of this series on calling and discipleship. It is from uh, our gospel, the gospel of Matthew. Um, now, I wanna say a little bit um, just because we were originally gonna have two scriptures, one on welcome and the other one a harder passage from the Gospel of Genesis, or Gospel of Genesis, from Genesis um, about Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac. I have decided I am no longer preaching on Abraham sacrificing his son. It is a hard passage, it is a controversial passage, um, and it is hard to know what it means. For a long time, it has been preached as a scripture on sacrifice and Abraham's faithfulness. I have come to understand that many in the Jewish community preach this or teach this passage as Abraham got it wrong, that he wasn't listening faithfully to God. So between the Jewish community and the Christian community, I, I think we have a little work to do on this passage. More than that, I think it's a traumatic passage if we're talking about the sacrifice of a child. So no longer am I going to preach that passage in church. If you want to talk about it, we could do it as a Bible study, but no more. Um, instead, we focus on how it is that we live out our call in ministry as disciples of Jesus Christ, and our passage from Matthew today is at the end of the gospel, or at the end of chapter 10 of Matthew's gospel. It is about rewards that we receive for doing the work of calling, and it is a very powerful, interesting passage in and of itself. It is about welcoming. It centers us in. I will unpack that more after our wonderful Jackie shares with you this passage. Jackie? I want to thank anyone who's responsible for attaching the rail over here on this side. So there you go. Thank you, Scott. So this passage is uh, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 through 42, only two verses. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. Henry Nouwen. Henry Nouwen is a Catholic theologian, wrote a book famous for writing a book called uh, The Wounded Healer, uh, and said this, Hospitality means primarily the creation of free space where a stranger can enter and become a friend instead of an enemy. Hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them space where change can take place. It is not, being, it is not to bring men or women to our side, but to offer freedom, not distributed or not disturbed by dividing lines. I could read that about 14 times as the sermon alone and just let it be. It is a powerful statement about the goal of hospitality as it is to bring us in, to make space for the stranger. Disciples are called to go out into the world and do good 
because God first did good for and with us. The vision, the mission of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who transform the world. Now, the work of faith, no matter what denomination you are home rooming with, is about getting out, building relationships at its core. It is about getting out, building relationships, doing good. Relationships in and of themselves are about the work of transformation, about connection, about community. The message that we are connected with today from Matthew's Gospel is at the end of chapter 10. But to fully appreciate the point that those few passages, those few verses we're making, I think we need to move back into the context of the totalness, the totality of chapter 10. Without belaboring the point, let me give you the brief summary. At the beginning of chapter 10, Jesus calls 12 disciples. He sends them out to the Gentiles to, quote, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and cast out demons. The whole point Jesus makes in Matthew's gospel for sending the disciples out is to go to the Gentiles, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, and to cast out demons. Jesus says in this chapter, if the house you visit is worthy, so he's sending the disciples out to houses or communities or or folks, if the house you visit is worthy, let the peace come upon that house. But if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, here's a favorite passage, shake the dust from your feet when you leave that house or leave that town. So disciples of Jesus go out, do these things that Jesus says, if they listen to you, peace be upon them. If they don't, shake the dust from your feet and keep on going. Now, just before Jesus gets to the rewards for the disciples for going out, he says, whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Chapter 10 of Matthew's Gospel, you could do worse than studying that one chapter, your entire um, season of faithfulness. It is that significant of chapter in our Gospels and in our Scriptures. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. These are all punctuations, powerful exclamation points of what it is to be a disciple. As the disciples then are sent out into the world to do the work of Jesus, it is clear that there are personal implications. There's work to do, sometimes people listen to us, sometimes they don't, and in the end, there is a benefit to us. Another way to say that, that I often tell youth is, membership has its privileges. We are people who are faithful and we are striving. So, when we reach the end of chapter 10 in Matthew's Gospel, we hear these words. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. When you receive a follower of Jesus, it is the same as welcoming Jesus. There is a reflexive relationship with the divine, with hospitality, and welcome is at the core of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. This is a core of our teaching, our understanding, and our process. Now, for those of you who are thinking to yourself, oh, thank God, welcoming is it. That's easy enough. Maybe it is, and maybe it's not. Welcoming is the core of our faith. It is the core of our call. It is foundational. It is of value. When you welcome another person, you are welcoming Jesus. When you are welcomed, you are welcomed by Jesus. To be welcomed and to bring people into hospitality, it is part of who we are called to be. 
when and where have you been welcomed? When? It is a provocative question that I invite you to think about in this moment. When and where have you experienced welcome and hospitality? I've been asking people that question this week because I've been thinking about this scripture and this passage about welcoming. When and where have you been welcomed? Now, most of the people that I've asked, as a matter of fact, I think all the people that I've asked have said the same thing. Oh, I've been welcomed in a lot of different places at a lot of different times. And they go on to talk about friends and um, community and uh, coffee shops and other places and um, sports groups that they participated in and events. I've been welcomed in a lot of places. When I think of welcoming, I want to confess here that in, in some way, I actually think of Walmart. <laughs> when I think of welcoming, I think of this Walmart greeter who stands out there in front and says, hey, when you walk in the door. I also think of the volunteers at hospitals that I go visit, those volunteers that sit at that front desk and greet you as you come in. There are many businesses that hire greeters to say, hello. So the question there is, is that really a welcome? Is that really a welcome? Does that walk in uh, Walmart, I feel seen. I walk in uh, Home Depot, I feel seen. I walk in my coffee shop, I feel that this is just good for business. I'm that cynical. I believe they're only hiring greeters so that we don't steal their stuff. So that you walk in the door. How is that for cynical, right? Yeah. So what is it that moves us from that place of hiring a greeter or signing somebody up to be a greeter? What is it who move, how is it that we move from that kind of, hey, how are you, with, with less than an altruistic purpose to this deeper space of this value that is inherent in both Judaism and Christianity. Leviticus is a, a, one of the first five books of the Bible. It is a, an early law in the Old Testament or the Jewish community. Leviticus 19, 33 and 34 says this. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns, sojourns, travels, moves around, immigrants, those kind of things, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt, and I am the Lord your God. Among our earliest writings in our Holy Bible are passages about welcoming the stranger about welcoming the one who comes from outside the border of your land. Maybe even the one who eats different food than you, has different ways of preparing food for you, who has different customs than you. The Old Testament, Leviticus 19. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall do, not do him wrong. You shall treat the tra stranger who sojourns with you as a native, as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. It is a powerful statement. It is a radical statement. There are some issues that don't carry through the entire Bible, um, but this issue of welcome and hospitality does. Um, Jesus doesn't just um, echo the spirit or the meaning of welcome and hospitality, Jesus really, like, throws down on it. Jesus was not rewriting the spirit of faith, but throughout his teachings, he is underscoring the value of welcome and hospitality. Later in Matthew's gospel, in about 
chapter 25, Jesus preaches, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Jesus knew that Leviticus passage. Jesus knew it and was giving fuller context to it and really underscoring it as a value of faith. If you could do nothing else, welcome somebody. There are many churches that mean to be welcoming. I've never gone to a church that didn't think it was welcoming. Have you ever gone to a church that didn't actually think that they were welcoming? Now, don't answer this question, but how many churches have you gone to that you really didn't feel welcomed? Many of those that I've gone to that didn't, I didn't feel welcomed at <laughs> are closed at this point. We don't need to comment on that. Welcoming is not just an essential to faith. It is essential to building community. There are few churches that are actually welcoming is my feeling about it. I mean, we all mean to be, but in some ways we fall short. In many ways we fall, occasionally we fall short. Occasionally we strive. Occasionally we strive. And as I'm talking about this, I am hoping that all of those stories and moments when you felt both welcomed and not welcomed are in your mind. That you're hearing that that story of your own personal faith walk moving through your heart and mind as you're thinking of what it means to be welcomed when you have and haven't been. There's a difference between welcome that is a courtesy and welcome that is sincere. Welcoming that is sincere means that you find yourself in a place where you belong. There is a welcoming that makes you feel like you are at home, that you can say what you believe most of the time, and whether people agree with you or not, they will love you anyway. Welcoming and hospitality is something we know in this congregation and hold sacred. I believe for this congregation, welcoming and hospitality is more than just a courtesy, but that it is a core of who we are. I was, um, Eldon, can I talk about you for a minute? Um, I should have asked you before now, but thank you. Um, Alden is on a um, worship planning call that we have at the beginning of the week, and so I always take the opportunity to ask Alden his opinion on whatever is going on in worship. And Alden is so bold and courageous that he actually tells me exactly what he thinks. I asked Alden about welcome today, and he said, I said, what do you think about welcome? And he said, this church is welcoming. Whether he knows your name or not, whether you know his name or not, he has felt welcomed here. Do you know how profound that is? That is not about the budget. It is not about how much we go out and do work in the world. It is not about anything that we've done. It is simply that we made somebody feel like they belong. If you have nothing else on your heart and feel uh, struggling with life, you should feel uplifted by that. People come to this congregation and have a sense of belonging. A sense of belonging. Recently, the United Methodist Church um, in our area started gathering in a group that is called Open Space. Open Space began meeting at our church. Uh, it is a gathering of people in our congregation that is uh, youth-aged people, but there is a young adult um, component also, and it is a group that is meeting to work on discipleship and Christian faith and study the Bible and just talk. And open space is distinctive in that it is specifically named as a group that is open to all people without regard to their sexual orientation, their gender identity, um, their sexual preference. It is an LGBTQIA friendly group. That is profound in and of itself. Um, and I have been meeting with the leaders of this group periodically to sort of learn about them and to support them. 
Um, and one of the things that they do at every gathering is begin with the Wesleyan question, how is it with your soul? How is it with your soul? Um, I've met several times with Reverend uh, Brogan Hunt, who is a newly ordained pastor at the Escondido United Methodist Church, and Claire Williams. And one of the visions that they have for open space is that they're not just welcoming, but they're welcoming and want people there. The phrase that they use is welcome and wanted. I confess I love this phrase so much because it moves us beyond the welcome that is a courtesy, the Walmart stuff. I don't mean to harass on Walmart, it's fine. But it moves beyond having a greeter there, a, a professional, a hired greeter. And it moves us to this space that says, you're not just welcomed. We don't just say hello, but we actually want you here. It moves to that space that embodies this Leviticus passage. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. It moves us to that space of embodying Jesus' teaching. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. You're wanted here. Not just because you can help us make the budget or because you can be a, a, a <laughs> council uh, chairperson or because you can do anything at all. You are welcomed here just because of you. Sounds very Mr. Rogers-y, doesn't it? This kind of welcome is the welcome that says, you're here now and let me make a friend of you and let me furthermore introduce you to my friends so that they will be your friends. It moves us beyond a statement of, I'm glad you're here, it, to a statement that says, let me get to know you better. You are safe here. How do you know that you are welcomed and wanted? How do you know that you are welcomed and wanted? When have you known that you are welcomed and wanted? Let me close with this. A quote from Dorothy Day. She said, A custom existed among the first generations of Christians when faith was a bright fire that warmed more than those who kept it burning. In every house then, a room was kept ready for a stranger who might ask for shelter. Think of uh, Mary and Joseph looking for a place to have Jesus born. In every house then, a room was kept ready for a stranger who might ask for shelter. It was even called the stranger's room. Not because these people thought they could trace something of someone they loved in the stranger who used it. Not because the man or the woman to whom they gave shelter reminded them of Christ. But because, plain and simple, the stupendous fact he or she was Christ. To welcome another is to welcome God. To feel that welcomed is to be treated by the divine and loved for. May it be so with you this week and always as we begin our next season together. In Christ's name, amen. the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine? 
virgin, so great a mercy. What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living we approach the time of prayer together, I want to lift up a couple of uh, prayer requests for you. Um, Many of you may remember Kevin and Cynthia Midlam. Uh, They were former members here and uh, Kevin passed away this last week. So we want to uh, hold Cynthia and the family in our prayers. Uh, Continued prayers for uh, Juna and Scott Spitz uh, for the losses in their family. Uh, continued prayer for Ko Kim. Rosalyn is here today and said that he is holding holding his own, so that's good news. But continued prayer for him, for Pat Hoteling, for Al Amaro and his recovery, and for Terry Peters. And then in addition, just uh, early this morning, uh, Carolyn Jewell, who was leading that class that do, to do signing for the uh, for the uh, Lord's Prayer. That class will be temporarily canceled because unfortunately she broke her arm this last week. So uh, prayers for her and uh, and keep keep tuned, those of you that want to do the class when that will resume. So let us enter into a time now of prayer together. Gracious God, help us to create the welcoming space of your radical hospitality. Remind us that at some point, it is likely that all of us have been strangers in life's journey. 
Life's journey takes us from the familiar to the unfamiliar, to different locations or different jobs, or meeting different people. And even as we a community, as a community lift up in our hearts those prayers for the persons near and dear to us, those that were named this morning, expand our spirits to remember and pray for those on the margins of society and of life and of those who have lost so many for recent violence of gun violence and for so many other things that have occurred. Expand our prayer. We recall that you said, when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. Beyond the sacred duty of offering care to another person or another people, we find that in welcoming, we are welcomed and we are wanted. The gift of the kind word, the open smile, an invitation to break bread together, expands our own world and can create community one person at a time. Bless the work that we do together in this way, so that when we find ourselves greeting the stranger, we are really greeting friends we just hadn't met yet. Grant that your grace opens our eyes to see you in everyone we meet. Amen. Let us continue in the attitude of prayer as we share together the prayer that Jesus taught his followers by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I remind you that all are welcome at the table of Christ. This is a table of God that has been set from long ago for us, no matter where we've been from and 
what brought us here this morning. You only need to have a sincere openness of your heart to receive God, and you are welcome at the table of Christ. We do have a gluten-free option with unfermented grape juice. We share in this community through intinction, which is receiving a piece of bread, dipping it in the cup, and knowing that you are loved. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Our loving God created the world and called it good. God created from long ago and claimed us as God's own. To those who were held back, God brought freedom. And through that, we find ourselves free to live in faith today. On Christ's last evening, he was gathered with his friends, the disciples, in the upper room as they shared a meal together. Christ brought attention to the bread that was before them, and he said to them, in the future, every time you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to God, and he said to the disciples, in the future when you do this, drink it in remembrance of me. Through this bread and through this cup, all are brought into the family of faith, all are forgiven. This, friends, is the great mystery of our faith. Let us say together, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Everlasting God, in whom deep calls to deep, you speak your word of life into the fullness of silence. Calm the fury of destruction around any caught up in a tornado or hurricane, earthquake or fire, any hardship in life. Come to those who yearn for peace or protection. Quiet every troubled spirit and strengthen every soul cast down. Silence in us all, clamoring for attention that is not your own. Give us courage to hear the sound of sheer silence that we may know your still, small voice. Bring us at the last into your holy presence and gather us with your saints around the altar of your praise when all who belong to Christ shall be one in you, eternal God, in the power of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. And God always sanitized God's hands before a good meal. <laughs> Friends, this is the body of Christ, which is broken for you. And this is the cup of redemption which is poured out for you. Frank, the body of Christ. And the love of Christ. And the body of Christ. And the love of Let me invite those who are helping us serve communion to meet us down front. I have the sanitizer. Let us share communion.
let us pray. Gracious and beloved God, you have indeed drawn a wide circle of welcome, of grace, of love. Let us know that we are apart and within, and that we are called to welcome others to the same. May we be blessed and a blessing this week as we have received your body and love poured out and given for us. In Christ's holy name, amen. We come now in the service to the time of responding to God's compassion and grace through making an offering. Your offering in response to God's love can be a commitment to do good or to pray for others or to speak kind and encouraging words. Your offering in response to God's word can also be a financial contribution to the ministries of our church. It is through your financial gifts that we are able to provide this worship online and continue doing outreach and ministry. No financial gift is too small. Every dollar that you offer matters as we work to serve God every day and lift up people. Please continue using the QR code to make a contribution or mail in your check or consider making a regular monthly offering. Thank you so much for your support and thank you for this shared ministry that we do together. Him. So I ask that you please join me now as we share our prayer of invitation and dedication. Mighty God, you have poured down on us all manner of gifts and blessings. The ledger of our lives is so overwhelmed with your goodness that we struggle with how small our offerings to you seem in comparison. The gospel reminds us that not even the smallest act of mercy and compassion, a cup of cold water, will go unnoticed by you. Give us the eyes to see those in need the ears to hear those cry for justice, and the hearts to comfort those hurting and grieving. If we, were all, if we all were to offer a cup of cold water, the world would be flooded with compassion. We ask this in Christ, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Let us stand now in joy and share our closing hymn and get a little air flowing. Holy breeze.
Beloved, go now out into the world, knowing that you yourselves have been welcomed, that you are seen, that you are loved, just as you are, today and always. Carry this love out into a hurting and needing world. In Christ's name, amen.